Serotonin basically deals with arousal, data flow, body temp, sleep. Dopamine, pleasure, memory, brain reward. Now the area of the brain that deals with most, most identified with brain reward is called the nucleus accumbens, the ple pleasure center. So here's the deal. Survival behavior, you are hardwired to repeat survival behavior. Survivor, survival behavior feels good. You're thirsty, you drink. Ah. You're hungry, you eat. Ah. You're sleepy, you sleep. Ah. Horny, etc., etc., etc. All that is run through the nucleus accumbens and associated with pleasure so that you repeat it. The way dopamine, and so dopamine, anytime a drug makes you feel good, dopamine is involved. So it's not just the primary substance that's affected, dopamine is also affected, which means that if it's pleasurable, the activity is going to be repeated. Now, they've taken cocaine and radio tagged it and to see where it went in the brain, and it goes directly to the nucleus accumbens. And it's powerful enough so that it is more intense than most natural experiences that you can feel. Okay, so when we were observing things during the crack epidemic, not that that's over, but when we were observing things like people smoking crack and then, you know, all of a sudden they would like give birth and leave the baby in the toilet. So you think about the process of giving birth, what could override maternal instinct over birth? Cocaine is powerful enough to do that. Okay, because it's going directly to the pleasure center and it's saying this is more pleasurable than anything else you could experience. And it feels like it. It's that intense. It's like I was saying, like with Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner, you know? You're, the drug is like dropping a safe on your head, literally. And so it is that powerful. So dopamine, pleasure, memory, brain reward. Endorphin, emotional pain relief, orgasm. So when you are stressed out, okay, and in pain, the body says, okay, you need to... Okay. So endorphin actually doesn't cut the pain. It just makes you feel better about it. You can handle it emotionally. So the pain is not cut, but your emotion it allows you to handle the pain emotionally. Norepinephrine, fight-or-flight response. Acetylcholine, uh, both inhibitory and excitatory. So it inhibits signal and it also in, uh, enhances signal. Anandamide, pain, coordination, memory formation, and general sensation. Phenylethylamine, you know, when you're falling in love and you have butterflies in your stomach, that's the hormone that does that. Testosterone and estrogen. So both sexes, and all humans make both. How they affect you emotionally depends on the rest of your genome. And I don't mean to imply that there's only two sexes or two gender expressions either. But. All right, GABA, arousal, generic arousal. Okay, so 10. Now, here are the drugs. Serotonin, LSD, 
psilocybin mushrooms, SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil, Wellbutrin, etc. Remember LSD and mushrooms. LSD is more powerful than mushrooms and it competes with uh, serotonin receptor sites. So LSD is like the opposite of the SSRIs. It makes more data come in, the SSRIs screen data out. Dopamine, cocaine. Endorphin, morphine within, opium, morphine, heroin, Demerol, fentanyl, Oxycontin, etc., etc. So you don't actually cut pain with these drugs, you just allow you to deal with them emotionally. Easier. Norepinephrine, methamphetamines, ecstasy, mescaline, Effexor, Acetylcholine, nicotine. So the interesting thing with acetylcholine, because it's inhibitory and excitatory, so if you understand that in your body, the nerves that you use to raise your arm and the nerves you use to relax are separate. Excitatory, inhibitory. Excitatory, inhibitory. Nicotine affects both. That's why it relaxes you, but it doesn't put you to sleep. And you're awake. Okay, so those who worship the tobacco god, yeah, know this. Calms me down, but it doesn't put you to sleep. Because of its effect on both sides of the nervous system. Anandamide, marijuana and chocolate. Beta-phenethylamine, butterflies in stomachs, chocolate. Testosterone, steroids, estrogen replacement therapy, and estrogen. And GABA, alcohol, GHB, which is a date rate drug, and volatile inhalants. Glue, gasoline, Glade, Things that people, you know, paint thinner, uh, liquid paper, <clears throat> whippets, all right, so you can see in terms of like where, where drugs of abuse come in, if these chemicals are be basically already in the body and then are being affected by other chemicals that are like them, so like methamphetamine, as an example. So essentially, since um, norepinephrine, which is a cousin to adrenaline, it's also called noradrenaline, but norepinephrine triggers the fight or flight response. So if you, uh, whether you're a trekker or not, the idea is that you see a tiger in the jungle, we're conditioned, so if you're, unless you're feeling really bad, it's fight or flight, right? And when you're out of the danger, you experience a depression, oh. right? This is your body naturally re rebalancing. A drug like methamphetamine puts you on red alert and keeps you on red alert for hours. Okay, now this could be useful therapeutically if you're depressed. But a side effect of the drug, so the reason they use methamphetamine, for example, with ADHD kids and fighter pilots, is one of the side effects of the drug, and let me deal with side effects in a second, is it causes a focus of attention. Now, one of the side effects of focusing your attention is because it's a fight or flight drug, you get paranoid. Right? And it's neurotoxic, you know, if it's not pharmaceutical grade. 
because of the way they make it. Yeah. Question? I was just thinking about, so like, um, Adderall or whatever? Yes. It's fight or flight. Yeah. So, yeah, because it just, you're like strung out all day, basically. Well, yeah, Not you're strong. wired so yeah. that you can pay attention. Yeah. I mean, that's why they're giving it to you. Right? And the reason they give it to, say, B-2 bomber pilots is uh, White Men Air Base, not making it up, it's in Minnesota, White Men Air Base, right, is a, is a B-2 bomber wing. So during Kosovo, Kosovo, you know, round trip, you're not refueling, maybe you're refueling on the other side, but it's 14 hours. Right? How do you keep somebody awake in a cockpit that doesn't have coffee pot? You wire them out. And if they get paranoid, well, maybe you want somebody paranoid driving a half a billion dollar aircraft. That's not a bad thing, right? But you don't want them wired every day and you rotate them so that they're basically flying missions once a week or once every two weeks so that you don't string them out because you take it enough and you develop tolerance and we don't want our pilots getting strung out even though they might anyway. Right? But this drug was a really one of its first commercial uses was in combat. Which one? Like, Methamphetamine. World War I and II. World War I and II. Japan and Germany. Because one of the things it does is it is basically instilling a fighting rage. Right? You want, it doesn't kill pain, but you don't care because you're in a fighting rage. Now, one of the so let me give you the whole thing about side effects. All drugs have effects. Period. There is no such thing as a side effect. Side effect is a marketing term. Okay? Side effect is an effect of the drug that they can't market to sell the drug. Okay? They are legally required, especially since they were allowed to begin advertising, they have to tell you the side effects. So you'll notice, you know, the talk about, you know, let's see, what's that drug? where her depression is like a robe, or it's a hole, and you know, she falls into the hole, she gets the drug, she's magically out, and she's talking with the doctor, and the hole is sitting there taking notes with her, my depression. Yeah, okay, and then they talk about, you may experience sexual <coughs> side effects. Yeah, okay, it's a SSRI, and SSRIs are involved with sexual arousal, as well as testosterone is sexual arousal in both or all gender expressions. T testosterone does that. That's what its thing is, among other things. Right? So you have sexual side effects with an SSRI because of serotonin's effect on that particular system and function. Right? Methamphetamine. All right? The reason it, you, it is associated with child abuse is because in men, it can produce an erection that doesn't go away. The con medical condition is called priapism. And it's painful. And the drug renders you unable to have an orgasm. Which is why rape is associated with wartime and soldiers on methamphetamine. That's why child abuse is also associated with male users, not that female abusers can't be sexually abusive either, but you know, they will try and have sex with anything. Or one. And the drug renders them unable to have an orgasm. So, and it's painful. So, yeah. So, that's a, not a, an effect you want to market with methamphetamine. But it is a natural effect of the drug. So, effects, you know, so aspirin, right? The side effects, basically the primary effect is that you want it to dilate blood vessels so that your headache goes away. Its side effect is that it irritates the stomach. And some people are allergic to it. So we come up with acetaminophen or ibuprofen, other NSAIDs. 
Okay, so all drugs have effects. Side effect is a marketing term. Side of the effects are the natural effects of the drug that they can't sell. <laughs> Basically. So, you know, when people are taking their meds, I don't like my meds because of the side effects, so I'm going to smoke weed to cancel out the side effects of, you know, my Cymbalta or whatever it is, you know, my effects or whatever. The effects are wiring me out, weed mellows me out. You know, problem with that is that you don't know what the dosage of what you're smoking is. Right? And this state, you know, I'm just talking about by in comparison to other states, not advocating one way or the other, I'm just saying we applied a pharmaceutical standard to cannabis, separated out the constituents that you want that don't get you high, they have the effect that you want, like they do in Colorado, which is not what this current initiative in Oregon is about to do. <laughs> I'm just saying this once was a pharmaceutical drug, but we didn't have the technology before 1930 that we do now. We didn't have the knowledge of the chemicals that we do now. Wait. Um, Come with it. So, crap. Oh, wait. So, I can't remember what I said. Uh, it's about marijuana. Not as potent. So, for example, cannabis sativa does not make THC to get people stoned. It makes cannabinoids as a defense against fungus and mold in tropical areas. So for example, on your right, on your left is anandamide, which is your brain's chemical, and then THC. So notice that THC is bigger, more complex than anandamide, but part of THC slots into the anandamide receptors. That's why it works. Basically the same system, opium, pop, opium poppy sap and synthetic opium poppy sap, you know, Oxycontin does, slots into endorphins and receptor sites. So particularly, the plant seeks to protect leaves, flowers, and seeds. THC resembles the neurotransmitter anandamide. So s strictly speaking, there are no THC receptors, there are anandamide receptors. So for example, this slide basically shows anandamide is involved with diverse brain areas such as pain perception, balance, coordination, sensory input, movement, judgment, uh, memories in there as well, right? So here you have brain areas associated with coordination, vision, sensation, movement, judgment, reward system, the nuclear accumbens, memory, pain, so that's why marijuana and THC products have all those effects. It is effective for pain, of course. Okay? But since it's also engaged with brain reward, it's also going to be addictive because anything pleasurable is going to be repeated because that's what you're hardwired to do. Okay? But whether you would, you know, if you tried to go cold turkey from Oxycontin and tried to go cold turkey from marijuana brownies, you know the difference between withdrawal syndromes. I can't make a judgment either one way or the other, but I know what many people I know would, if their pain can be effectively managed with a cannabis product, as opposed to fentanyl and oxycontin. Hmm, yeah. But the challenge is, of course, with anything, it can be it has, if it's addictive, it can be abused. So, like opiates, while it doesn't stop pain, it does deal, allow you to deal with it emotionally. And since it produces pleasure, as part of its effect, it's involved with brain reward. Which means that it can be addictive. Section of the THC molecule resembles anandamide, so it's not an exact match. 
So again, you have receptors all over the body for all these different substances, and that's one of the physical and psychological uh, explanations for why drugs work and why they become addictive. Sugar and salt being drugs basically work in a similar way in terms of being psychoactive substances as well. But people don't just pound salt shakers. Because <laughs> it's already in the food. It's already in your food. So, question could be like, when is it a problem? It's a problem when you go beyond the safe and effective dose for the drug. It's a problem when you take a drug that wasn't prescribed for you. It's a problem when you take a substance not designed to be a drug. It's a problem when you use, your use affects your body, relationships, job, and legal status. I think the next slide, you know, and also when you develop tolerance and withdrawal. And it's a problem when you can't quit. So we'll also get into um, alcohol as a drug next week. Thank you.